Well, here we are in the middle of a snap general election campaign, which I'd be surprised if, if any of us would have predicted a few weeks ago before the announcement that it was going to take place. It's one of those things where, in retrospect, it seems very uh, unsurprising, but of course at the time it came as a massive surprise, partly perhaps because the Prime Minister had repeatedly and categorically denied that there ever could be a snap general election on numerous occasions. Um, but there we are, she's had a sudden change of thought, uh, change of heart, and we're now facing an election which the Tories, and I will argue, um, basically the, the whole of the British capitalist establishment are hoping it's going to result in a landslide Tory majority. Um, and the one kind of fly in the ointment, ointment, the one possibility of preventing that happening is, I would say, Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party. And so here we are to discuss how we can make that a reality, how we can make the, a Tory defeat, a Tory disappointment a possibility through Jeremy Corbyn. Um, but before I get onto that specific concrete question, I want to reflect a bit on the kind of period we're in, the context of this election. I think that we can't really understand the election and the election campaign properly unless we talk about what's been going on over the last few years. This is the, of course, this is the second general election in basically as many years. It's about two years, isn't it, since the, uh, just over, since the 2015 general election. It's also now the fourth meaningful vote that we've had in, again, as many years. We had the Scottish referendum. Obviously, we weren't voting in that. Um, but we had the Scottish referendum in 2014. We had the election in 2015. The EU referendum, of course, the year after. And now we're, the British public has been asked, again, to make a pretty important decision on the electoral field. And I would say all of these elections reflect the massive instability that exists within British capitalism, but also within global capitalist, ca capitalism. We, uh, as Marxists have explained many times really since the 2008 crash, that all of the attempts on the part of the state and on the part of the capitalist class to redress, if you like, the instability, the, the imbalance and the contradictions thrown up by the crisis in the economy at the basis of capitalist society, all of the attempts to restore equilibrium on the economic plane would result in economic instability, chaos, if you like, crisis. And I, th I think that we're seeing an element of that. But of course, it's not this unconscious, mechanical relationship that you suddenly just have complete instability. The state itself and the establishment are trying to react back on that. They're trying to stabilise things further. And I would say we've seen that in the, um, the attempts of David Cameron, uh, remember him, the, the last PM, or the gambling that he went about doing in order to try and restore some kind of semblance of order within his own party and with his own government. Um, I'm sure we'll all agree that the, the attempt to uh, the, the calling of the EU referendum was an attempt to blatake, uh, blacate, sorry, a very vocal and uh, an increasingly influential wing of his party, which of course reflects at the base of society, especially amongst the Tory rank and file, which had become increasingly narrow and based on a certain section of society, a rabidly Eurosceptic or pro-Brexit section of society. It was an attempt to redress that balance and shore up his majority. And of course that gamble then reflected back on the stability of British capitalism as a whole and ultimately on the economy, which is surely being affected and will be affected by Brexit. You could say something similar about the Scottish referendum as well. Of course, the Scottish referendum didn't go against Cameron, but of course what was going on was a, was a, a huge shift in Scottish society, a massive change in the political landscape, which resulted in the SNP sweeping almost every seat in the general election after that. Now, I'm sure you're already aware of this. And the setup that we have now is a Tory majority with a working majority of 17 MPs that up until recently, and I'll get to this, was looking at investigations into 30 of those seats. Of course, that's now no longer in the pipeline. We'll discuss the reasons for that a little bit uh, later on. But also has a, I think at the time of the, um, the referendum, a majority, if I'm not mistaken, of Tory MPs reflecting uh, the base of their party campaign vocally for Brexit. A situation in which Theresa May is facing Brexit negotiations where we're not just talking about the EU officials and EU bureaucrats, we're also talking about the very important interests from the point of view of British capitalism of the City of London, of the British capitalist class who need the single market to sell their goods for passporting in the realm of banking and finance, financial services, which of course are a very important part of the British economy. You've got these interests on the one hand and then behind her she has a party which is 
campaigning or was campaigning for Brexit, which will accept nothing less than a hard Brexit, and any kind of movement backward, by which I mean a concession on having to pay the 60 to 100 billion, the figure seems to be plucked out of nowhere, but the billions of pounds that the UK will be asked to pay one way or another, or to uh, capitulate on the jurisdiction of the European, sorry, the Court of Justice of the European Union, as it's now called, or the question of freedom of movement and so on. Any concession on these quite important topics would result in an enormous rebellion, not just in the Tory party, but also in the country amongst um, the most passionate wing of Leave voters, which would leave the majority utterly worthless. So, as, as we explained at the time, a socialist appeal, Theresa May, up until this point, and I would say still at this point, is caught between a rock and a hard place, or a rock and a hard Brexit. She is forced, effectively, to take this very, very hard position, which is against the interests, it cuts very strongly against the interests of the, the bulk of British um, capitalism and the British capitalist class, in order to make sure that you have some semblance of political stability. Now, you have, a, uh, I would say, a, an attempt, a calculated attempt, to overcome that problem, to overcome that obstacle. And that's what this Tory majority that they're aiming for is all about. And it's a, an open secret. Um, there's actually a very interesting article in the Financial Times by Martin Wolf, who's the chief economics correspondent, who, which is entitled, if I remember correctly, it says, May has an opportunity to, to basically retain membership of the single market, which is interesting because you don't associate a May victory with remaining a member of the single market. And he goes on to explain, and I'll quote from the article, for Mrs May, the aim of the election should be allowed to her to make decisions in the national interest, by which he means, of course, the interest of the British capitalist class. With extra time and a larger majority, if achieved, she could make unpopular but necessary decisions. The past week will have shown her that these will be very unpopular. He was referring to the disastrous dinner that got leaked, uh, leaked sorry, with John claude Juncker. But if she obtained a smooth transition via membership of the single market and customs union until a long-term agreement is reached... She will have given UK business and so the UK economy what it needs most. Avoiding a big shock in 19, uh, 2019 is a prize for which it is worth paying a great deal. It is a chance the election could give her. She should take it. So you here have, a, if you like, a spokesman, uh, one of the strategists of capital. I've heard that expression used in relation to these people. Someone expressing quite directly the interests of the capitalists in this matter. For despite the fact that Theresa May is standing on a hard, hard Brexit programme, I would say the whole of the British establishment is mobilising behind her in order to make sure that you have a strong and stable government. Have you heard that expression before? I didn't know. <laughs> it's the campaign slogan for the Conservative Party, if you're not aware. <coughs> a strong and stable government which, in the not-too-distant future, can make decisions which will be cutting against its own social base, it will be cutting uh, against the, um, the, the British population for the most part, and I don't just mean in relation to Brexit negotiations, we are talking about Tory government here, so the austerity and attacks on the working class are very much going to continue, but which can withstand this, it can withstand the shocks which everybody knows is coming. Everybody knows that over the next couple of years there are going to be major concessions being made and there are going to be major political shocks in Britain, and perhaps internationally as well, which could of course impact on, on the, um, the situation in Britain. And so a, Tory, a three-figure Tory majority would hopefully, for them, provide a cushion, which means they can then basically turn around and act directly in the interest of the capitalist class. And this shows, that it, it expresses itself concretely, I would say, in quite an interesting phenomenon, that you see almost unanimity, I would say, in the way that the media in particular, but also the British establishment, are behaving in this election. Now, I mentioned briefly the question of the 30 seats that were under investigation for electoral fraud. Now, the Tory party was fined, it was found guilty, responsible, if that's the word, by the Electoral Commission for basically non, not declaring its expenses. Um, it had a number, not just one, but a number of battle, so-called battle buses going to important seats full of activists, and it wasn't declaring its expenses in the local uh, um, areas where they were campaigning. And the Electoral Commission said that's electoral fraud, fine them £70,000. The Crown Prosecution Service looked into the matter to see whether um, criminal investigations for electoral fraud would be appropriate. Not convictions, but investigations to then bring charges. And it found that in all 30 cases, no further charges would be brought. Before the election, I'm sure you've already seen the headlines saying the Tories cleared, Theresa May could re um, release a, a breath, a, a sigh of relief is the expression I'm looking for, and then could say, see, they've done nothing wrong. 
Tory MPs were coming out demanding apologies. One Tory MP said that heads should roll at the Electoral Commission for even bringing this up. It's worth looking into this. Um, because the CPS said that the reason they weren't going to uh, look into any further charges was because although there was clear evidence that a misreporting, an underreporting of expenses had indeed taken place, that's never been in question, so the wrong had been committed, if you like, all of the people being investigated, or potentially investigated, all of the local activists and electoral officers, or agents, I think the word is, sorry, whose responsibility was to report correctly this information, they didn't know they were doing wrong because the Tory National Office had told them that they were sorting it out. So, no harm done then. The Tory party can get away with basically buying seats or attempting to buy seats. Um, now, the fact that this is taking place just before a very, very important election, not just for the country, but specifically for the interests of British capital, is not a coincidence, I'd say. I would say that this is an example of the British establishment acting, if you like, in its own interests by backing a given political party in an election. I would say this gives us quite a good demonstration, a subtle demonstration, although not that subtle, thinking about it, of the way that bourgeois democracy actually works. It's not quite as, as simple and idealistic of, oh, we all get a full and fair decision on who rules us and we can hold those people accountable. What we're seeing is when the situation gets a bit more murky, when the class struggle, the picture of the class struggle starts to rise, after years and years of austerity, when millions and millions more people are having to fall into precarious employment, having to go for, for food banks, basically for, for charity in order to survive, and the anger, the level of anger, resentment, rage even in the country is rising and rising and rising. The way that politics functions is it becomes a bit different to how it was in the 90s, for example, in more stable times. And what we're seeing now is that the, the state, the establishment, is more prepared to act directly and intervene in the so-called democratic process, in order to make sure that the, the right result comes out of it. I would say that another example of this can be found in the media. I would certainly argue that the BBC is part of the establishment, a state-owned broadcaster, which I would say most of the time, especially in stable, um, stable times on certain issues, maintains a veneer of, of respectable impartiality, You know, is, is asking questions, holding politicians to account regardless of their political creed. But what we've seen, particularly over the question of Jeremy Corbyn and our <coughs> coverage of him, is something a bit different, I would argue. The, the coverage of Corbyn has been, since he became the leader of the Labour Party, but it certainly hasn't let up during the election campaign, it's been a constant diatribe, portraying him as a terrorist sympathiser, which is quite an inflammatory headline, um, a, a, a weak, indecisive, dangerous leader, Somebody who wants to uh, take the country back to the 70s. That's not actually the BBC, that was the Daily Mail and the Telegraph. Um, somebody who the public basically can't trust. And that, that message, believe it or not, is seeping through at the base of society. And I, th I think this is a conscious editorial decision, frankly. There's another element to this, which is the BBC has shown quite a pro-Tory bias, I would say. A bit more subtle than its anti-Corbyn bias. But in relation to the way that they deal with the Tories, even back in the Cameron Osborne days... Um, the way that they would interview Tory politicians was extremely soft compared to the way they would deal with Corbyn and pro-Corbyn MPs. And even now that's continued. We've got a Prime Minister who was campaigning on a, sl a slogan of strong and stable leadership, often just showing in certain Labour heartlands or former Labour heartlands, she's campaigning with a massive poster with just her face and then the Tory symbol just maybe about this big in the corner. Because she's going for people voting on her, having a strong hand in negotiations. You've probably heard that expression as well. So she's campaigning on, on decisiveness, strength, leadership qualities. And yet she's so terrified of journalists asking her difficult questions, or even easy questions, frankly, the way she performs. She's go resorting to locking them in rooms, or I've heard the word cupboard used. I wasn't there, I don't know the size, of the, the dimensions of the room in question. But she was locking up journalists until she was ready to give them three minutes and was refusing to allow them just to film a simple, quite routine visit. It was in Cornwall, I think. I think it was a factory in Cornwall. This shows that a certain level of panic. I would say this demonstrates that based on the very high polling relative to Labour in particular, the, well, not just in, uh, Labour in particular really, but the very high polling that the Tories have got, in part, and I would say in the main down to very sympathetic treatment by the media and the relentless campaign against Corbyn, not only from the media and the Tories, but from elements, quite influential elements, within his own party. They're now hoping to ride the surf on this wave, if you like, and, and hope that nobody gets in on the act, effectively, that nobody actually sees how inept 
so Theresa May really is, or actually gets a glimpse of the real Tory programme. As far as I'm aware, and people can correct me in the discussion, but as far as I'm aware, the Tory programme is basically strong and stable leadership. Those are the policies they're going to put into place. They're going to have strong leadership, they're going to have stable leadership, so that they can then conduct negotiations to achieve this Brexit where we leave the single market but also get an even better deal than the single market. Sounds fantastic. And she cannot be questioned on that because there's nothing beyond that. This presumably is why she's refusing to debate with anybody else. Personally, I think that's absolutely scandalous. I mean, I, I'll declare a prior interest. As a Marxist, I've never had a huge amount of faith in the kind of impartiality and openness of bourgeois democracy. But this is poor even by its own standards. In America, you had several debates. In France, you've had several debates. But in Britain, the sitting Prime Minister, who is hoping for a three-figure majority and may well get it, isn't prepared to debate with other candidates. And... Again, you can correct me if, if you disagree on this, but I feel that the treatment of this scandal by the media has been a bit soft, to be honest. Surely they should be making a big deal about this. And yet they're not. And I think the reason they're not is because they too are a bit worried about what would happen if they were to put her on the spot. I think she'd crumble. Now instead, what we've got is a... can't call it a debate. I don't know what you call it. A dual interview where the two main candidates, Theresa May and Jeremy Corbyn, are going to be interviewed and asked questions separately. We'll see how that goes. That could still go wrong for her. But, um, but you can see, I would say, the establishment putting up barriers, trying to protect their candidate that they're rallying behind, even if they don't necessarily agree with everything she says, in the hope that the national interests, the interests of British capitalism, can overall be safeguarded. And um, as to be said, that part of this campaign, as I've already mentioned, it's not just confined to the, the, um, the, the media and the, the various state institutions, there is a section of the Labour Party that's playing the same role. I would say there's a section of the Labour Party which is consciously playing this role. The, the so-called Blairites. Now, I appreciate that the anatomy of the Labour Party is a bit more complex than just Corbynistas and Blairites, but there is, I, I would hope that we can all agree, there is a core of right-wing MPs who consider the eviction of Corbyn from the leadership of the Labour Party to be the most important goal even including during a general election. I would say, in support of this claim, that I've seen videos, I've seen a video of John Woodcock MP, saying, don't worry guys, Corbyn's not going to be the Prime Minister, but just for the record, I think he is too dangerous to be a Prime Minister. This is a Labour candidate in an election. Now, less scandalous than that, there are also plenty of MPs who, I'm told, are campaigning on a purely kind of local, on their own personal basis, if you, if you know what I mean by that. So they're going up saying, I'm a good constituency MP, I'll show your views are represented. Basically not campaigning on the policy points that Corbyn has put forward. And I would imagine there's probably quite a few Labour MPs, right-wing Labour MPs, that aren't going to campaign on the manifesto that's just been leaked, in any form. Instead, they're just going to campaign on, ignore him, it's all about us. However, if it all goes the wrong way, I was going to use a different expression, but it all goes the, the wrong way and Labour loses very, very badly. Of course, it will all be Corbyn's fault. He was poisoned on the doorstep, so on and so forth. And the media will parrot that with glee. This is something that I think we have to be alive to. It's a very important aspect of this for us as people who want to see the end of a Tory government. I believe that a Corbyn victory is the only way to secure that at this stage. And so to move on to the kind of the... the the most pressing question of, well, how is that even possible? How can we make this happen? It's worth first looking at what the, the lie of the land is so far. So we've had the local elections, and what we saw... Uh, what we saw in those was it was a bad day for Labour, and we saw the Tories picking up many, many council seats, especially from UKIP. Basically, UKIP lost all of its seats but one. It, it actually managed to win one in Lancashire from Labour, unfortunately. But it went down from about 145 to one council seat, and almost all of that was going to the Conservative Party. Now, this gives us an impression of the kind of trajectory that we're seeing, that now in many cases, this will be former Tory party activists or former Tory voters to the right, even of that party, who moved towards UKIP, who are now coming home. But we also have to be alive to the fact, we, don't, we shouldn't be complacent about this, we need to be alive to the fact that in certain areas particularly in Labour's northern heartlands, as they call them, there will be people who move from Labour to UKIP who are now considering voting Tory for a number of reasons. Um, one, of course, is the question of Brexit and perhaps the manifesto pledge that basically the Labour Party accepts and acknowledges Brexit um, may help. 
But other parts of it are, first of all, the media campaign to make Corbyn out like he is basically a dangerous enemy of the state. I would imagine that's affected the way people think about it. But also there's an element of conscious, uh, conscious cover-up, really, of Corbyn's message. I saw one statistic that claimed that only 7% of people had heard his slogan for the many, not the few. 7%. That's clearly not enough to be penetrating into the minds <coughs> of the electorate. But that gives us, I would say, also a glimmer of hope. That the more people, I would argue that the more people who actually hear what Corbyn has to say and hear what policies he's put for, putting forward, the more people are going to be considering voting for him. As long as the media and the Blairites maintain this chorus in perfect harmony of saying he's unelectable, people don't like him, people think he's dangerous, then that almost becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The more his policies, which the BBC, Laura Kingsbury's article out today said that many of the points, most of the points in the manifesto, are popular and have polled well consistently. So the more those ideas are getting out to the public, and the kind of the real Jeremy Corbyn, if you like, then the more we can expect to swing towards Labour. We shouldn't be deliriously expecting that it's going to be like a, a, an immense swing and that you're going to have a huge Labour majority. We do have to be realistic about this. But the, the predictions of a la Labour landslide, I think, have been put forward so forcefully in order to make that a reality. And there's a certain amount of hoping for that to become a reality. Tory landslide. A Tory landslide. What did I say? Did Labour. I say Labour? Sorry. <laughs> My mistake. Um, I think we can see this, or the potential for this, within the polling. So already, um, we've seen that uh, the last figure I saw, and again, if there are more recent figures, please do uh, jump in with them. But the last figures I saw showed a Tory majority, of, I think it was either 14 or 16 points. It depends where you look. Now that is very large, and the Tory proportion was about 44 points. Um, one I saw had 46. But before, it was up at 48, which means the trajectory for the Tories at this point has been downward, and the trajectory for Labour at this point has been upward. It's interesting that what's happened in, that, in the meantime is Theresa May has been basically running away from journalists. There was one BBC reporter who could only just manage a picture of her head above a hedgerow as she went diving away from him. He wasn't even allowed to cross the road in order to get a better picture of her. Whilst that's been going on, Corbyn has been campaigning and the Corbyn movement is beginning, is beginning to get mobilised and we've seen more policy um, ideas coming out. I'm very interested to see what the polling figures are like next week or the next time they do after this leak. I would hope that it would, um, it would reflect an increase in the proportion of Labour um, votes or intended votes. We'll have to see how that goes. But if that's the case, I think that should give us hope. Hope that if we get involved, if we campaign vocally... For Jeremy Corbyn's ideas, but I mean, more importantly, and I'll go into more detail on, uh, on this, for a bold, a revolutionary programme, a big overturn, a great overturn in the way that politics and society is currently run, then actually there could be a very big upset in this election. At the very least, this massive majority that the Tories are looking for could be thwarted. And a big disappointment for the Tories here means that the kind of instability that we I'm sure we're all predicting for the next couple of years is still very much on the cards. I'd say that instability is still there, but of course the Tories are going to be much less well equipped to be able to deal with it if, it doesn't have a, if they don't have a three-figure majority. So, first of all, being more vocal and getting the ideas out there alone, I would say, can make a dent in the Tory majority. But there's more to it than that, and I think we can learn lessons from abroad in this um, respect. I would say that the kind of phenomena we're seeing in Britain with the anti-establishment feeling, the, the move towards different forms of nationalism and chauvinism in, certain, in, in great swathes of the population in different forms, and the general kind of rage that, is, that we are seeing in politics in Britain are certainly not new, unique phenomena. We can see them in the United States surrounding their election, and we can see them in France as well. And in both of those elections, we can also see them in other countries, but to concentrate there, in both of those elections, yes, we did see right-wing populism and nationalism gaining a much bigger echo than it had before. But we also saw left-wing candidates gaining a much, much bigger echo than they had been done before. Bernie Sanders is, of course, a standout example of this. Now, Bernie Sanders' programme is, if anything, to the right of, the, of Corbyn's and the Leap Manifesto, particularly on foreign policy. But in terms of the spectrum of American politics, he was far, far to the left. And he was coming out calling for a political revolution against the billionaire class. In America, he was talking openly about revolution. Now, of course, his idea of what a revolution should look like, I imagine, would be different to ours. 
But he was using this language and it connected. It connected particularly with the youth, but it also connected with a large, large layer of American society that felt completely left behind, disenfranchised and alienated from politics and I would say from capitalism. They may not express it like that, although many of them did in fact. Um, even a certain section of Trump voters were looking in his direction. There's an anecdote that I, I heard around the time of the campaign, which I'll repeat here. It was when Sanders was still in the running for the Democratic primaries, and Trump had already basically won the Republican one. And you had a big Trump rally, thousands of people there, big screen, rock music, or the whole shebang, what you'd expect. And on the big screen, you had a, a footage of Hillary Clinton speaking. And the response from the crowd was vitriol, shouting, hissing, screaming, the kind of hatred that Trump um, supporters showed towards Hillary throughout the uh, whole campaign. And then a clip of Sanders came on. Sanders, of course, running for Democratic primary on a very different program to Trump. And instead of that, you didn't quite get cheering, but you did have this begrudging silence, this kind of slightly respectful, we're not sure what to think about this guy, because you cannot accuse Bernie Sanders of being the Wall Street candidate or crooked Sanders. Those epithets simply don't make sense. Now, in France, it's an interesting fact that the FN, Front National, one of the reasons why it's gained such a big and big um, mass base over, the, uh, over the, uh, well, the last decade, basically, or, or a bit more than that, is because it's been eating up into formerly communist areas, com as in voting for the Communist Party. Working class areas that, again, have felt completely abandoned by, they, they use the language of globalisation, effectively talking about global capital, the deindustrialization you've had in some areas, and the feeling that there's, the whole of politics and society is run by a completely alien elite that doesn't act in their interests. And the communists, to their shame, have had nothing to say about it for all this time. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a running th theme in all of these elections, which is the kind of the, the failure of the centre-left and the social democracies. And they're paying for it. In France in particular, the Socialist Party was in government. And it's paid for it, and its austerity programme, having been elected on an anti-austerity programme, is paying for it by having their candidate gets smashed in the presidential election. And now, from what I understand, the party itself has split about three ways, and I would be very, very surprised if it did well in the legislative election. We're looking at the persocification, that's a hard word to say, the, the, the Greek disease, if you like, of the French Socialist Party, and deservedly so. The Communist Party has been impotent throughout the entire, its entire proceedings. Meanwhile, the right is building. There's a link between these two things. But the candidacy of Jean-Luc Mélenchon cut across that to an extent. Clearly, he didn't eliminate the Front National uh, presidential campaign. But he got 19%. He came within a whisker of actually being in that second round. And I think if he got to that second round, there was a very good chance he could have won it. As it happens, actually, if you'd factored, if all the people who voted for the new anti-capitalist party, and I forget the, um, the name of the other party, it was the Trotskyist party, who also stood a candidate, if the... If the Three, roughly 3%, I think, of people who voted for those candidates had voted for Mélenchon, he would have got to the second round. That's a contingent factor, but what this shows is that this idea that being kind of anti-establishment left and being a far-left candidate is so unpalatable to the public you could never do well, it explodes that idea. And I don't think it's just because of French conditions and French history. I think it's something that Corbyn could emulate. And one of the ways he could emulate it is by copying some of the, the campaign techniques and some of the messages that Mélenchon so successfully deployed. For example, Mélenchon was having huge rallies, not just of a few thousand, but over 100,000 in one case in Paris, and about, it was either between 70 and 80,000, memory, memory serves, in Marseille, and Marseille happens to be a Front National stronghold. It shows that you can go to places, mobilise people, get your support together, and it's not just the Blairites say, oh, that's just talk, preaching to the converted, you'll never win around the public like that. But mobilising your support, energising them, sending them out into their communities does have an effect. I would say that the Mélenchon campaign and the Sanders campaign both demonstrate that. Mélenchon was even using holograms of himself. I mean, I don't know if, I don't know if that would suit Corbyn. It sounds, it sounds very science fiction, but it's a reality, so maybe, maybe you should give it a go, I don't know. But either way, he was making sure that he got his face out there, that he overcame, if you like, the conscious media blockade of showing anything positive about him by basically doing his own media. And social media can play a role. I'm, I'm not one of these people who believe that social media in and of itself changes the way politics works. But I do think that one of the strengths of Corbyn during the leadership campaigns, and I would say potentially during this camp um, election campaign, has been that his supporters, who tend to be um, young, very active on social media, can get the message out there very quickly and very widely, more so than relying on BBC journalists with whom you have a cosy relationship, because that's not going to happen in Corbyn's case. So the, these kind of campaigning techniques can help, but also 
I'd say more importantly than just the techniques, we don't want this to be a purely technical discussion, is the way that the message was put across in both Sanders and Mélenchon's case. Once again, the cam their campaigns, their policies were actually kind of different. But the way that they were talking, they were talking in terms of revolution. Sanders was talking about a political revolution against the billionaire class. Mélenchon was talking about a citizen's revolution. Now, you might say that's a bit of a vague, what does, exactly does that mean? The meaning is different for different people. What we can say is that a large number of French people connected with that word revolution. I don't think they were connecting to the citizens part, but I do think it was the latter part, the revolution part, that people were co uh, connecting to. I would say Corbyn has to talk in these terms. I'd say that he's done a good job. So far, <coughs> his campaign launch, he was saying, we don't play by the rules, the establishment are afraid of us. If I were Mike Ashley, I'd want a Tory government. I, want, when, I, I think that's a good way to begin your campaign. But I think he needs to start using the R word, because that's what, that is what we need in Britain. And I think there are a great many people who do believe that to be the case. And at the moment, there'll be layers of the population who feel that to be the case and are still unsure as to whether that is what Labour represents. Now, that, a big part of that is for the reasons I've already explained, so I won't labour the point, no pun intended. But the, the main message coming through, I would say, is that a fundamental root and branch change of society is needed, linked to the policies he's already come out with. I think that can mobilise even more people in the hundreds of thousands and, of course, if you get that connected to the 500,000, roughly, membership of the Labour Party, pulling as much as possible in the same direction, then, once again, it would be possible to achieve an upset. Um, there's, there's one point that I wanted to bring up earlier, but I think it's worth point, uh, bringing up now, which is a, a bit more of a general question about the, the role of individuals in history and society. I actually meant to bring it up earlier. But when we look at Theresa May and the role that the establishment is playing... I think we see this in, in action, in living action. Theresa May has been put forward by this strong and decisive leader. That's why everyone should vote for her, apparently. That's, that's the, the portrayal that we're getting universally, basically, over the media. And yet we, we know the reality to be quite different. We can see by the way she's behaved and the examples I've already given and the way that she's flip-flopped over so many issues, having campaigned for Remain, now being a hard Brexiter, having said, ruled out a general election, now we're having a slap on the general election. That doesn't give the impression of strong, decisive leadership. And yet... This is the image that's been promoted, and it is an image that's been bought by many, many people. And I would say that that's not because of her own personal um, qualities. It's not really a reflection of her genuine strength and leadership. It's a reflection of the class forces at play. We as Marxists would say that ultimately history is made, history is made by men and women going about their daily lives, but the determining element is the class struggle, the social weight, and social forces at play within society over a given question. And here's an example where the basic, basically the ruling class, except for a few kind of fringe elements, if you like, enraged elements of the, of the wealthy, like Tony Blair, like Gina Miller, who are campaigning on the Anything But Brexit programme. We can talk about them a little later. Aside from that, basically, the whole of the establishment is mobilising all of its social weight behind Theresa May, and, believe, and all of a sudden, hey presto, she starts appearing much, much stronger than she actually is. We can say, however, that with the experience of what happened with Trump, that that can be cut across. We shouldn't be pessimistic and say, oh, well, it, you know, whoever the media selects, whoever Murdoch selects, can win. Because in America, basically almost all of the media, massive media establishments, were against Trump, and he still cut through that. Now, of course, Trump is not the ideal candidate that we want to be backing, but he was an anti-establishment candidate, despite basically being a member of the establishment, that managed to cut across the media. It shows it can be done. And Corbyn, the reason I bring up this question of social weight is because Corbyn also has his own social weight. I don't know if you've been looking into that. So you provide quite a lot of detailed polling. And for Corbyn, Corbyn's Labour, has the largest proportion of people under 50. Not just the youth, that's in the kind of the, the 18 to 30s, or however you define youth, 18 to 24s. But anybody under 50, not anybody, but the majority, the largest share, I need to get my words right, the largest share of people under 50 are intending to vote Labour in this election. It's only when you get to the over 65s that Labour's vote share plummets to about 10%. This shows that if you can actually, and of course I, I would say that the youth represent the future of society, it's a cheesy line, but it is the truth. It shows that there is a social force there who's willing to get behind Corbyn. And that if, it's able to bring, if he's able to bring those into the campaign and connect to that, and I think that there are points in the manifesto that certainly have the potential to do, to do that, then he can make a massive impact. And it's something that we should play upon in the campaign. Um, and so in terms of the manifesto, actually there was another point that I wanted to raise about the manifesto, which is that um, Polly Toynbee, 
I don't know if you're aware of who Polly Toynbee is, but she stood for the Social Democratic Party in 83. So the SDP became the Lib Dems, so stood against Labour, and now has a kind of ambiguous, ambivalent relationship with Labour where you know, she attacks Corbyn one minute, but then she supports Labour. She described the manifesto as a cornucopia of delights. <laughs> Unironically, I think. It's, I mean, it shows the confusion on the Labour right that they kind of don't really know what to think about Corbyn at times. But it also shows that that does reflect, I would say, that somebody who has called for Corbyn to step down, a critic of Corbyn, is saying this. I don't think she's just saying this out of party loyalty. I don't think she has a great deal of party loyalty to the Labour Party. I think she's saying this because it reflects that there are, there are meaningful policies that actually address the problems of the country. Now, we can talk about the limitations of the programme. It's, it's certainly not a, a communist manifesto, which I think would be um, a, a better programme. But... He's calling for the... I don't mean literally the book, The Communist Manifesto. <laughs> but he's calling for the abolition of zero-hours contracts, which I think we should all get behind. Um, we should support to the hill. He's talking about um, abolishing um, employment tribunal fees, something that in, when I was working as an employment law- lawyer was an issue very close to my heart, and I think it's close to the hearts of many workers who have been uh, oppressed and exploited in the workplace. Calling for an increase in trade union representation to actually mobilise for that, and of course the abolition of anti-trade union laws. There are good policies here. It's interesting that many of those policies would be completely run-of-the-mill mainstream social democratic policies in countries like Norway. And some people have been saying that actually, even in relation to Labour, they're not really that radical. It's to the right of the 83 manifesto. It just shows actually what Labour manifestos have been like for the last 20 years, the ones that we've known, that this comes across as so radical. So this is a message that can connect, but it can only connect if it's able to break through the blockade, if you like. And I would say it can only do that if it's done in an extremely bold and clear socialist manner. So on the question of what next, and I'll finish on this. First of all, what can we do? Concretely, what can we do in the next few weeks to to help mobilise for this, uh, well, we'd hope Corbyn victory, but basically to defeat the Tories, to thwart the Tories' plan? Well, the first and most obvious thing I'm sure you're already thinking of is we should get involved in the campaign to elect Corbyn's Labour. Um, There are many ways you could do that. Joe already mentioned about if you put your name and details on for, to hear about future meetings, also put your constituency, because that means that when we as Marxist Student Federation members go to canvas in a given area, which happens to be the same constituency as yours, we can go together, which I think would be a good thing. Also, Momentum have done um, uh, are putting together lots of different ways in which you can get active. They're talking about phone banking, so you don't actually have to go and travel to a marginal seat to make an impact, which I think is a good idea. They're also talking about, it's basically a carpooling system, so if you go on their site, you can look at which marginals need people to go and when it's happening, and you can actually arrange lift with people. So there are plenty of opportunities, and of course campaigning in your own local constituency is also an option. I think this, now is the time that we should be getting involved in this activity, and not just making the case for Corbyn, but also um, you know, explaining socialist ideas. It can be done, and it should be done. Um, also, I mean, another more immediate thing is, as I said, Corbyn has a, the largest proportion of the youth in support of him. When it comes to students, he has an absolute majority. He has 55% of students polled backing him. Um, So we as young people and students should be making sure that literally everybody we know is first of all registered to vote and votes Corbyn to make sure that that vote as much as possible can be mobilised to make the difference. Um, This is another very simple, concrete way in which we can make a difference. But there's beyond, beyond this, let's talk briefly about after the election. Obviously, I'll start with our favoured outcome, albeit a bit of an unlikely one, but our favoured outcome, a, Tory, uh, <laughs> a Corbyn majority, a Corbyn win, in, in which case our first priority has to be defending the Corbyn government and his programme against the inevitable onslaught and sabotage, not just of the, the establishment and the capitalist class, which, believe me, would be even more ferocious than what we've seen already, but against a wing of his own party. Personally, I believe that if Corbyn were to be elected, he would struggle to apply any of the points in his manifesto because a good section of his party probably wouldn't let him. So we have to think, um, already, we have to think ahead about how we can actually make that programme a reality. I would say that, first of all, in order to be able to carry out any of the meaningful demands in that manifesto, Corbyn would have to take radical, revolutionary steps against the capitalist class, against the banks, against the vested interests, in order to do things like abolish zero-hours contracts or reverse the privatisation of the NHS. It's not just simply a question of a government getting into power and then saying, oh, this is what we want to do. 
we're talking about it would effectively be class war in that case, and in, in which case the Labour Party and Corbyn would have to be able to take a revolutionary stand on this. This is something that requires people within the Labour Party, the base of the Labour Party, who have a Marxist understanding of this question, campaigning, calling for this. Because without that section, without that base of support, then the trajectory of the party will be ever rightward. And then on the question of within the party itself, as I already mentioned, the Blairites would do everything in their power to, including splitting the party, and therefore bringing an end to this fiction, you know, this putative Corbyn majority. The only way that we can combat against this is by combating against Blairism and the right wing within the party. And I'm not just talking about the MPs. Mandatory reselection, I think, is something, well, first of all, it should be present in any democratic party structure. But also, it's the only way that we can actually get the parliamentary party to correlate with the real existing situation on the ground. But also beyond that, the, 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 the bureaucracy, the machine of the party is totally within the hands of the right wing. We know, many of the people in this room know this because they've been expelled by just suddenly receiving a letter saying because you sell the Social Appeal newspaper, you're no longer eligible to be a member of the Labour Party. I very much doubt that Corbyn is personally overseeing the expulsion of left-wing activists. I'd be very disappointed if that's the case. I think it's probably people like Ian McNichol and the bureaucracy of the Labour Party. This has to be swept out, and the only way it can be swept out, swept away, is by a root and branch uh, movement to change the Labour Party, to transform the Labour Party. Corbyn has opened the door... But we have to, you know, push him through it as much as we can. Um, and I think both of these points, in reality, apply in the event of a Tory victory. Now, I don't think it would actually take all that much in such a huge, you know, impossible change in situation to thwart the Tories and either have a kind of status quo situation or worse for them, something like a hung parliament. But really the purpose of this discussion, I don't think, is to speculate on the exact result. The point is that in the event of a Tory victory, the Blairites again will be calling for uh, Corbett's head, saying, of course, he lost the election, he's unelectable, he has to go, it'll be chicken coup too. Now he is apparently, he rode back on this, so it's a bit ambiguous what he, what he actually is going to do, but he said he wouldn't step down. I would say he shouldn't step down. If Corbyn steps down before this kind of transformation of the Labour Party can take place, unable to have any other kind of left-wing leader ever again probably, then that is basically the end of the process. I think it would be a step back for the left and a step back for the working class. It wouldn't be a, a, you know, the final defeat of the working class by any means. There are bigger things on the horizon. But it's something that we should try as, as we might to act against. So the same campaign against Blair is in the Labour Party, which are the conscious agents of the establishment within the party, in my opinion. And this pushing for the application and uh, campaigning of, uh, for, on Labour's programme on a revolutionary socialist basis putting forward the need not just to, to try and patch up the, the capitalist system, but actually to overthrow it, which is actually the only way that many of the good demands in Labour's manifesto can be put into application, I would argue. This is the way that we have to act, both before, during, and after the election. And on that, I think I've spoken more than long enough, and I will end. Thank you. Thank you.